Um, I've got 59 minutes on this recorder, so uh, I shall have to be short. Um, <laughs> I'm all thinking of your lunch now, aren't you? Since when is 59 minutes short? Well, there are some dodgy teachers out there, short and long. And uh, the question arises, whose teaching should you listen to? We've seen uh, sects and cults set up you know, within our purview within the last couple of months. We hear all sorts of things being said in uh, apparently big churches in cities and across the world. Whose teaching should you listen to? Do we say that'll be good ministry because there's a big church there? Should we listen to people who have a big church ministry? Mm -hmm. We might. Should we uh, listen to people because they've got a, a city centre congregation and big student population and does that give them authenticity in their ministry? Well, it might do. Do, do, we, do we accept as authoritative and reliable and faithful teaching of the people who've written a number of good books? I've read some good books recently. Does this authenticate their ministry that they've written the books? Because this is Wales, does it authenticate their ministry to have a big name? I'm really glad some of you are looking worried and shaking your heads. It's marvellous. Because we need to be able to exercise discernment about what we hear. About what we accept as authoritative ministry. Does having a big name make a man whose ministry is accredited by God? An authentic. Paul has brought us to the end of this letter where, in his absence from the, the church in Galatia, he's, he's had to provide a, a strong corrective to the way that the Judaizers had led that church. He's had to really put it on the line about what scripture truth is. And of course he's not there. And you can anticipate, can't you, people in that congregation say, who is this Paul bloke anyway? Who does he think he is? I sometimes wonder whether you, you've actually faithfully ministered God's word at all if, if people haven't actually raised that question with you. Who do you think you are talking to us like that? Paul's in that situation. So what is this concluding passage in Galatians 6, 11 to 18 about? It's set against that background. And of course there are some tasty morsels in it. You can go to verse 14, or you can go to verse 15, even verse 17. You can take those out of the passage as a blessed thought for the day, or even post them on Twitter, just so everybody knows you've done your quiet time this morning. But what is Paul actually doing or saying with this passage? Right here at the end of this powerful, authoritative, necessarily confrontational letter to this troubled Galatian church, Writing it to those people from outside. A church that's been troubled by people coming to it from away. Claiming to be somebody. Claiming the authority of the big church up in Jerusalem. And subverting the gospel preached to them by this, this maverick fellow Paul. Who goes off around the edges of the known world. Talking to strange people. You begin to see how just reminding yourself of the background of the passage of Scripture helps you see the foreground in focus. What's he having to do with these people? There are people that are in the church in Galatia claiming big authority, claiming that they are somebody, leading the new believers away from the gospel that Paul originally preached to them by which they were saved. And Paul, absent from them, has had to write powerfully to try to encourage them back on track. He had to teach them with authority. That's what a pastor is for in Scripture. A pastor is not there to keep everybody happy, funnily enough. A pastor is not there to put on a good show on a Sunday so people come back next week. A pastor is there to authoritatively teach Scripture to people. And sometimes, you know, the shoe pinches. That authority with which Paul has taught them is bound to get challenged. And here, in this closing passage of the book, 
Paul underlines and he seeks to, to finally and clearly establish his authority, the authority of the message that he preaches and with which he writes to them. And he starts by establishing the authenticity of his letter in the strangest of ways. He says, look, read this. Look at the immense lack of sophistication in my handwriting. Why does he highlight this end of letter scrawl? See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Now just, just think that through. Those sophisticated big city Judaizers from the church at Jerusalem who come down and they're teaching the people. They're steeped in the meticulous handwriting of their rabbinical and tribal traditions. They would never be caught writing to these Celtic tribes people of Galatia in this way. They would never lower themselves like that. Their standards, in inverted commas, wouldn't allow them to. And Paul is saying, this authenticates my message. The big scrawly handwriting means you ought to be believing this. How does it do that? How does it authenticate this message? Come back with me to chapter 4. How does this scrawly big baby handwriting, how does it authenticate, give authority to what Paul is saying? Well, here's the question. Why is Paul's handwriting so large? Pardon? He's not very well. He's not very well. I plead with you, brothers, Galatians 4.12, become like me, for I became like you. You've done me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. I came to you and preached the gospel to you because I was ill. Hold that thought. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you didn't treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What's happened to all your joy, I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. What is the illness that Paul has, which is the reason that he's preached the gospel to these Galatians in the first place? It's to do with his tonsils. It's got to be to do with his eyes. I mean, come on, let's use our brains. It's to do with his eyes. He's got dodgy eyes. So why is Paul's handwriting so large at the end of the letter? Because he's got a dodgy nose. Because he can't see. Because he can't see very well. Giddy stuff, this, isn't it? Because he's got dodgy eyes. He was stuck there in Galatia, amongst these hairy tribes people, because of his infirmity, because of his eyes. And they had pity on him, and they didn't despise him, the way some people reading that letter even then might have scoffed. The Celts loved Paul so much for his gospel, they had to be willing to rip out their eyes and replace his with theirs. Why? Because those dodgy eyes were the authenticating mark of Paul's own experience of God and of the gospel that Paul preached. How? Why? Because when he had been, worse than a Judaizer, a God-hating, gospel-loathing, blaspheming, persecuting, violent man, in fact a murderous Pharisee, opposing the church and the gospel of God, at that point God met him. How did God meet him? God met him on his way to give grief to the believers in Damascus. And how did God do that? Did, did God lend him a book? Watch this. You're in student work. Watch this. I'll lend them a book. Watch it. Could be good. Could be good. But could be a cop out. Lend him a book. God didn't lend him a book. God stopped him in his tracks as he was walking down the road to Damascus and he saw Jesus. He saw the risen, ascended Lord of glory. And the brightness of seeing Jesus did what to him? Changed him. Yes, it changed him ultimately, but first of all, what I'm looking for is it blinded him. Just come with me and it'll be alright in the end. So it blinded him. And we know that he had a very bad case of dark eye. Because scales fell from his eyes a few days later. Yes, how? Yeah, I thought I'd identify with you. Yeah, very bad case. They led him by the hand into Damascus. A little while later, having sorted himself out with God, something like scales fell from his eyes. He's left with damage to his retinas. Because he has seen the Lord Jesus Christ 
as the risen, ascended Lord, with all the glory, with all the appearance of the Son of Man in Daniel's prophecy, who is led into the presence, the presence of the Ancient of Days and is called into the throne room of God and is seated as God's regent upon God's throne. Where's Paul's theology about Jesus come from? It's come from that meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. Because when you mix that with all that Paul knows about the Old Testament, you get the Gospel. Because he has met with Jesus, he's got dodgy eyes. And that same Jesus is the one who gave him this Gospel he's preached in Galatia. And that same Jesus is the one who authenticates Paul's ministry. Physically, Paul has been partially sighted ever since. But that physical partial sightedness is the guarantee and seal of his spiritual 2020 vision where the gospel is concerned. And so he says, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own wobbly hand. Well, the wobbly bit is an interpolation into the text. I'm sorry. But you get the point. Paul is using his partially sighted big round handwriting to remind the Galatians of his authority to teach them these things. His authority, firstly, as the one who under God had brought them to faith in Christ because of his visual health problems. That's why he was there and told them about Jesus. And secondly, as the one whose physical eyesight issues were the sign, the seal, the guarantee of his spiritual insight into the Gospel of God. So his personal God-induced infirmity was the sign and seal of the authenticity of his teaching. Is everybody happy? I, I, feel, I feel like a little hallelujah at this point, isn't it? It's a bit like Jacob wrestling with God and God touched him. Touched him in his hip. And he lived from that day forward and every time he lived he remembered his God. who laid his hand upon him and called him and set him out on the ministry that, that he had. Okay, <clears throat> so, Paul says, look at this dodgy android in my mind, what a lark. <clears throat> but actually what it says is this. Personal authentication. The Gospel's authentic ministers are authenticated because the touch and the mark of God has come upon their lives. And sometimes it costs. 